In this lecture, we'll talk about matrix equations, which are another way to look at the systems of linear equations and vector equations that we've already been talking about. So first we need to define what it means to multiply a matrix by a vector. So given an m by n matrix, and whenever you see that notation, the first number indicates the number of rows in the matrix, and the second number indicates the number of columns in the matrix. So the rows go left to right, the columns go up and down. So we're going to give names to the columns of this matrix. So when we write it, and you see it down here, so this is how I'm writing my matrix A, this little a1, that's the first column of A. Little a2, that's the second column of A. And little an, that's the last column of A. If it has n columns, then the last column will be a sub n. So given that matrix, and given a vector x, the matrix A times the vector x, so in this case the vector x is just a typical column vector like we've seen before, then when we multiply the matrix by the vector, that's just giving us the linear combination of the columns of A, where the coefficients, the scalars in the linear combination, are the entries of the vector x. So it's really just the first entry of x multiplied by the first column of A, the second entry of x multiplied by the second column of A, and so on and add all those results together. So it's just a notation for a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. So just to do a quick example, so here we have a matrix A that has three columns, and we're multiplying it by a vector that has three entries. And so the definition says that it's the first entry of the vector multiplied by the first column of the matrix, plus the second entry of the vector multiplied by the second column of the matrix, plus the third entry of the vector multiplied by the third column of the matrix. So that's 4, 0, plus 6, negative 15, plus negative 7, 21. We add those vectors component-wise. 4 plus 6 minus 7, that's 3. And 0 minus 15 plus 21, that's 6. And so that would be the result of multiplying that matrix by that vector. Notice that the number of columns of the matrix has to equal the number of entries in the vector. If those two numbers aren't the same number, then the notation doesn't make any sense. So if you try to multiply a matrix by a vector, and the number of columns in the matrix doesn't match the number of entries in the vector, it just is undefined. It doesn't make any sense. But now this gives us three different ways to write a system of linear equations. The first way is to simply write the equations themselves. That's where we started this whole journey through linear algebra. What we've learned more recently is that we can write this as a vector equation. So I look at the coefficients of x1 in my two equations. So in this case, I've got a 1 in the first equation and a 0 in the second equation. And then the coefficients of x2, which are 2 and negative 5, giving me that vector. And the coefficients of x3, which are negative 1 and 3, giving me that third vector. But now what we also have is that we can write this linear combination x1 times the first vector plus x2 times the second vector plus x3 times the third vector, we can write that in the form of a matrix times a vector, where we take the three vectors, put those into the three columns of a matrix, and the three scalars, x1, x2, and x3, and put those as the entries of a vector. So it's just, again, a different notation to write the same question of what are the solutions, if any, of this system of linear equations. And the way that we solve any of those is by constructing an augmented matrix. And the columns of the augmented matrix are going to be the vectors a1, a2, and so on, up through an. And then the last column of that augmented matrix will be the numbers on the other side of the equal sign, which in this case is the vector b. Now, very often we'll abbreviate this notation and simply write capital A, b in brackets. It's really important when you see that notation, though, that you realize that capital A is a matrix. So that capital A there actually represents the several columns of A, and then one more column tacked onto it with a B. Now, just like before, we're interested in the solutions of this system of, of equations, of this matrix equation. And what we know is that that matrix equation is going to have a solution if and only if B is a linear combination of the columns of A, because AX that's what that means. That means a linear combination of the columns of A. So to say that I want to look at the equation ax equals b, and if x is the variable, what we're asking is, is there a linear combination of the columns of A, 
Is there a way to construct that linear combination so that the result turns out to be b? Now, we've also considered this question of whether every vector is in the span of some number of vectors, a1 through an. And so if those vectors, a1 through an, are the columns of a, then that's the same as asking whether this matrix equation, ax equals b, has a solution for every possible vector v. And I promised you in the last video we were going to learn how to answer that question. Here's a possibility, though. Let's work through an example, and then we'll get to the answer of how we would know in general. So we've got this matrix, and we've got this vector b, which we're just thinking of as a generic vector with variables as its entries. And the question is, is the equation ax equals b consistent for all b? And the way that we're going to do that is by constructing the augmented matrix, which has the same columns as a, and the augmented part, that's this additional column where these b's are going to live. And so we're going to row reduce this matrix, because the question of whether this equation is consistent has to do with where the pivots are. So the way that we're going to figure out where the pivots are is by doing row reduction. So we've already got a 1 in the first row, first column. That's good. So now we want to get zeros below. So we're going to multiply row 1 by 4 and add. 1 times 4 plus negative 4 is 0. 3 times 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. 4 times 4 is 16, plus negative 6 is 10. And then 4 times b1 plus b2, that's 4b1 plus b2. Notice that we're going to have variable expressions in that last column, and that's okay. Now we're going to multiply row 1 by 3 and add it to row 3. 3 times 1 plus negative 3 is 0. 3 times 3 is 9 plus negative 2 is 7. 4 times 3 is 12 plus negative 7 is 5. And then 3 times b1 plus 3, b3 is 3b1 plus b3. Now to get the echelon form here, the only thing I have left to do is to turn that 7 into a 0. So rather than put this into reduced echelon form, which would require me to divide row 2 by 14, which would create some ugly looking fractions, let's just multiply row 2 by negative a half, because negative a half times 14 is going to be minus 7. That's going to cancel out the 7 that I want to get rid of. So that's not going to change row 1. It's not going to change row 2. I'm going to leave it as 14, 10, and 4b1 plus b2. So we're multiplying row 2 by negative a half and adding to row 3. So that gives us a 0. Just like we predicted, that's going to be a 0. Now negative a half times 10, that's negative 5, plus 5 is 0. And now what we have is negative a half times 4b1 plus b2 added to 3b1 plus b3. So we've got a little bit of algebra. This is a little harder to do in our head, so we're going to go off and work this out. So we get negative 2b1 minus 1 half b2 when we distribute, plus 3b1 plus b3. So that's going to give us b1 minus a half b2 plus b3, and that's what we're going to put in that last slot. Okay, so we're in echelon form now. So the question is, is this equation consistent? Do we have a solution? Well, we should be worried about this expression down here. Because if that number, b1 minus 1 half b2 plus b3, if that number is not 0, then that's a pivot. And we have a pivot in the last column of our augmented matrix, which we know tells us that we don't have a solution. That tells us that our original system of equations is inconsistent. So the answer to this question, if it's asking for all b, the answer will be no because we can find values of b1, b2, and b3 for which that number will be not 0. So for example, maybe I could let b1 be, let's say, 5. I'm just making up numbers here. b1 equals 5, b2 equals 4, and b3 equals 6. Well, in that case, b1 minus 1 half b2 plus b3, that's going to be 5 minus half of 4 is 2 plus 6. That's going to be 9. And 9 is not 0 which means we have a pivot. And so the answer to the question of is ax equals b consistent for all b, that will be a big no. But it will be consistent for some values of b, because we can certainly think of values of b1, b2, and b3 that will make that value equal 0. For example, what if we let b1 be, let's say, 2, b2 equaling 6, 
and b3 equaling 1. Well, in this case, b1 minus 1 half b2 plus b3, that's going work to work out to be 2 minus half of 6 plus 1. That does work out to be 0. And so that would be an example of a vector b, 2, 6, 1. That would be an example of a vector b for which ax equals b is consistent. So the answer to this question overall is that ax equals b is consistent for some values of b, but not others. And so just to recap here, what went wrong? Why didn't ax equals b have a solution for all vectors b? Well, the, the real problem here is that the echelon form of a had a row of zeros. When we row reduced our matrix, we got something that looked like 1, 0, 0, 3, 14, 0, 4, 10, 0, and then the last column had a bunch of junk involving b, right? And I don't remember all that junk because it was a bunch of weird algebra expressions, but it doesn't matter, right? The problem was that a in its echelon form had a row of zeros, and the expression that we got here in this last position in that the crazy b column the expression there could have been not zero, right? There were values of b that we could plug in that would make that expression b not zero. And so if every row of a, right, remember this, these, all of the columns except for the last one, that's, that's where the a came from. So if all of the rows of a have a pivot, then we can't have this problem, right? There won't be a row of zeros for us to worry about there being a pivot in the last column of, of this augmented matrix because the only pivots that we'll find, if there's a pivot in every row, then there won't be room for there to be a pivot in the last column. And that means since there isn't a pivot in the last column, ax equals b will have a solution, and it won't matter what b is. So this is a theorem, right? So we can prove this theorem. A theorem, that word theorem here just means a provable true fact about mathematics. So the setup here is that we have an m by n matrix, and again, remember that means m is the number of rows and n is the number of columns. So then we have the following statements being logically equivalent. So the first statement is that every b in Rm, the equation ax equals b has a solution. The second statement is that every b in Rm is a linear combination of the columns of a. The third statement is that the columns of A span all of Rm. We talked about that using span as a verb in the last lecture. And then statement number four is that the matrix A has a pivot in every row. Now we need to emphasize here, when I say the following statements are logically equivalent, I'm not saying that all of these statements are always true, because for some matrices they won't be true. The matrix that we were just talking about in the previous example, these statements are not true, because we could come up with examples of vectors B for which ax equals b did not have a solution. So what is it that we're really saying when we say these statements are logically equivalent? Well, what that means is that if any one of the statements is true, then they all have to be true. And if any one of the statements is false, then they all have to be false. Logically equivalent means all four of these statements are either all true or they're all false. It's not possible for some of them to be true and some of them to be false. Logically equivalent is another way of saying that they have the same truth value. They're all true, or they are all false for any given matrix A. A couple more things to talk about. There's actually a more convenient way to think about multiplying a matrix times a vector, which we will uh, find very useful as we go forward. So the way that we defined this is we said, well, you can take each entry of this vector and use it as a coefficient, as a scalar for a linear combination of the columns. But there's an easier way to go about this. What we're going to do is we're going to go across the first row of my matrix and down the column of my vector. And we're going to multiply each entry by the corresponding number. Notice that because the matrix has the same number of columns as the entries of the vector, then these are going to match up. So this is going to be 4 times 2, so the first number times the first number, plus negative 1 times negative 1, the second number times the second number, plus 0 times 0, the third number times the third number, plus 1 times 5, the fourth number times the fourth number. And we're going to do that in the second row. So we go across the second row, we get 2 times 2, the first number times the first number, 5 times negative 1, the second number times the second number, 
negative 2 times 0, the third number times the third number, and then finally 0 times 5, the fourth number times the fourth number. And again, however many columns, however many rows you have, you just go across the, the entire row and down the column. So 0 times 2, 3 times negative 1, negative 4 times 0, and 1 times 5. And it's a little bit easier to do in this way because it's just really just doing arithmetic. So in this case we get 8 plus 1 plus 0 plus 5, which is going to be 14. In the next entry we get 4 minus 5 plus 0 plus 0, so that's negative 1. And then the last spot we get 0 minus 3 plus 0 plus 5, so that's going to be 2. And typically, if the matrices and, and the vectors are relatively small, we can typically do this in our heads. We want to double check our arithmetic, you know, good to have a calculator handy just in case the arithmetic gets a little nasty, but typically we can do this much more quickly in this way. One more thing to talk about real quick, and that is that if we have a matrix and u and v are vectors and c is a scalar, then we have a couple nice algebraic properties. So the first property is a distributive property, so a times u plus v is a u plus a v. And the second property is uh, sort of a rearrangement, almost like a commutativity. It basically says that if you have a matrix times a scalar times a vector, that's the same as the scalar times the matrix times the vector. Because we really have a lot of different operations here, operations on vectors with each other, scalars and vectors, matrices, and so on. So, and they're relatively easy to prove, so let's just go through the proof of letter A here. So let's just keep things simple. Let's just say that A is a matrix with three columns. Obviously, we want this to work in general, but let's just keep things simple. So A is A1, A2, A3. And let's let U be U1, U2, U3, and V be V1, V2, V3. Well, then A, U plus V, that's the matrix A multiplied by the vector U1 plus V1, u2 plus v2, u3 plus v3. And by the definition here, that's really just a linear combination of the columns of A. So that's u1 plus v1 times the vector a1, u2 plus v2 times the vector a2, and u3 plus v3 times the vector a3. Now we have our nice distributive property for scalar multiplication um, uh, by vectors. And so we get u1a1 plus v1a1, u2a2 plus v2a2 plus v3a3 plus, sorry, that's u3a3 plus v3a3. And then let's just rearrange. Let's put all the u's together and put all the v's together. So we get u1a1 plus u2a2 plus u3a3 plus v1a1 plus v2, a2, plus v3, a3. And these first three, that's just a times the vector u. And these last three, that's just a times the vector b. And that proves letter a there. The proof of letter b is very similar. It, it, these these element-wise vector proofs are fairly dry, so, you know, and, and this isn't something that you would necessarily be responsible for doing on your own, but it just gives you an idea of, of why these properties work the way they do based on our definitions.